are in this world and whatever time of day it is. Welcome to the World Storytelling Cafe. And it is Monday night, so it is connecting the world by story and connecting the world tonight. We have none other than David Thompson himself, who's got this magnificent cast for today. So I'm going to shut up in a second before Baba Kitsi shuts me up. And I'm going to pass the whole thing across to Mr. David Thompson. Big round of applause for David Thompson, ably assisted by Jackie Ross. Over to you, David. Hello. Oh, okay. Hello, Michael. I want to be that. Okay. Oh, okay. Hello and welcome to the World Storytelling Club, everybody. The Michael Part Welcome back to part two. And if you missed part one, you can get it on Facebook. Uh no bad. But uh you so we're going to start with your story tonight david yes oh, good oh. good now i think everyone needs to put david on speaker for his story and I'm just going to tell you a little pressy of what his story is about and then that will give you time to put him on speaker so that you can get the full glory okay David's story is about a boy from Romania who lives in his world this boy wants to tell stories but he can't speak an old man helps him he helps the boy to make his dreams come true. Over to you, David. You will tell the story in your own language. Oh. Well, um. Um, the work he did of the door, the what do that of my death? I the game. And do the now go to it. So, on my work, on the 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 even the. The what I do, the ego, oh, um, what the battle, the the do we are in now, a kid love. We do now. 
Kid, oh no, Kiloke, no, do, oh ma, oh ma, od do, da, ma, do, wa, Kid, ah. What did you do? Oh, what, what do you mean? I need to do, I need to do did thou die not did we do all my death uh do we keep all the local I can't get my dog da oh da get wrong wrong na oh my day my daughter did that for Bo-da, do-do-da, na, da, ma, do-do, di, o-do, bo, na, ma, ka, da. Bo Kid I need Bo Oh my God Oh Kid 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 I Kid 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 what the 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 what the 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 I am the I did do I did born I did now the do we in the look down the do the the do what me letting clean clean the no 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 no. That is the wrong to make that for. Okay, that is to make that for. I for. Can I for? Do. It all done. Do it at the at the ultimate. Now, before that, go over over the. Do it. 
a ki ko vi po a e tu tu le tu tu vi pa pa I do like a happy ending, David. But, uh, Excellent. The, at the end of the board, he doesn't know the way that the way the way to I didn't catch the end of that, David. The end of the Everybody. Everybody can clap. Bo. Mm -hmm. Bo. Oh, La I see. Okay. Yes, some people. Yeah. Well, David, thank you for sharing your story in your language. And... We, we missed it last time, so we're, that's why we thought we'd better start with it this time. We didn't want to miss uh, it again. It was great, David. I think you did, it's just a Zoom thing, but you, I mean, when you're using sign, usually your hands can go everywhere, but it's very difficult. You have to try and keep them, uh, keep them on the screen. You did very well. It was uh, most of the time uh, your hands were on the screen, but... We, we know there was wonderful signing going on just off the screen, but it's you just imagine you're in a very small... Imagine you're doing sign language in a cupboard and, <laughs> with it in front uh, of your face. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I have a question. Uh, David, when you sign, uh, I'm not familiar with all the signs. When you sign, are you using ESL, ASL, or sign language of which... Sign language are you using? What? It can uh at the time. Uh little that door is a metal. Macaton. We're using Macaton. Uh uh. Oh, I'm not familiar with that. Okay. Macaton is that, quite simple. So it's very easy for people, to, to, to hearing people, to understand because it's very much like the old man with the yes. beard. It's very, it's very visual. Macaton is very visual, isn't it? Yeah. So, I, think, and uh, I don't, I don't mean this question for so, but when one well, learns Macaton or sign language, bad, does that make you bilingual? Mm. Uh, I, I, I'm not with. Not with the uh, it, it where we are, it not good. We are a B S S. I think, sorry, David. Um, I think technically. Makaton isn't a language, it's a signing no, no. system. And the, the language oh. that most people here would speak would be British Sign Language, although there are regional oh. variations. Um, so that would be the language. But Makaton is a, a system that's used quite widely, oh. particularly, um, mm -hmm, oh. David? Mm -hmm. Okay. The la we we the the uh oh the the oh the the matter the the um it oh the so uh, it, it's easy to understand for autists is that uh, uh, people with autism yes I. Uh, I, I, in, a, in a sense, I suppose it's simpler, isn't it? Um, and when I taught um, children with additional needs, it was Makaton that we often used. Um, I think if you are deaf, then you would learn British Sign Language, but quite often 
and um, children with other needs would learn Makaton, I think. Is that right, David? Uh, and speaking of... Uh, sorry, David. I need to go now. You need to go for your tea. Okay, well, you've given me the program, uh, so uh, will I just carry on? Do carry on, I'll be good. Okay, you, you'll be back. Well, I'm glad we got your story this time. Okay, enjoy Miss, your uh, tea. Missing you already. And I'll be go back. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you'll, yes. you'll come back. But yeah, we'll see you Jackie. later, David. Sorry, John. I'm not sure on the list we went through yesterday yeah, that yeah. Cooley was on it, and Cooley's going to do something today. Cool. We'll add oh. Cooley in. Don't worry, we won't miss out on Cooley's wonderful No, poetry. because I need to listen to her, because I, oh. I think she's great in poetry. Definitely. But since we were talking about language, I think we're going to go on to Lisa, because David asked Lisa if she would talk a little bit about language acquisition, um, and I'll leave you to go on. Lisa, yes? Is that what you're expecting to do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think so. Um, you, you can hear me, yeah? Thumbs up. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, okay, I'll just keep, I'll just carry on and chat. Okay. So I'm talking a little bit about um, Stuart, my, my hero, as I call him. He's well known as the hero. So Stuart was what was known as nonverbal until he was appro approximately five years old. However, I prefer to refer to this stage in his life as pre-verbal, because not once did I ever think he wouldn't or couldn't communicate. I knew he could, I knew he was. I was just the one who needed to learn his language so that I could communicate with him and be the one to teach others. And this is exactly what we did. Stuart's communication started through play and by joining him in his play, we developed a method of conversation albeit this started with just eye contact and vocalizations. But this progressed to shared play and sounds that soon resembled the start of actual words. With lots of hard work known as intensive interaction and using many methods such as props, jigsaws, toys, arts and crafts, music, visual aids such as pecs, social stories, electronic devices, and overemphasizing any time I communicated with them as well as really listening to Stuart, it all aided in reassuring him to verbalize what he was trying to communicate. Using motivational tools has and continues to be something that works well. To help reassure and encourage his speech, we used his love of navigation. Stuart has always enjoyed studying Google Maps and has a phenomenal mind for memorizing items of interest. We went for runs in the car, and providing it was safe to do so, Stuart would be my navigator, still is. If he said left, we would turn left. If he said right, we turned right. If he said stop, we stopped. As I said, only if it was safe to do so. Doing this brought Stuart's speech on leaps and bounds. However, the next challenge was teaching him that he wasn't going to be the navigator every time we went in the car. That part was slightly harder. Now that Stuart was starting to verbalize and use language to communicate, as I had done previously, I would overemphasize when speaking with Stuart and I felt it was important to use the same word to describe something to minimize confusion. For example, a buttery in Aberdeen is called a rowie and rolls are softies. However, we call them in this house, butteries and rolls. And it was important to pass this information on to Stuart's PAs, for example, so that everyone working with Stuart was using the same language. I also wanted to make sure I used English rather than the local dialect when speaking with Stuart, as I felt it was important to keep things as simple as possible. Only once he had mastered the English word could I teach him the local dialect, and that is pretty much where we are right now. Stuart is 12 years old and starting his transition to the academy, and I really can't believe it's happening. He has come such a long way. 
So how do I introduce Doric to him? That's the local dialect here. Well, in exactly the same way as I've introduced anything new to him, I drip feed him. He has heard me and others around him speaking the dialect, so it's familiar to him. And this has been the case for the past year or so. Even more so the last few months, because I have felt he is ready to understand it. I know he has interest in the language because he'll repeat some of what I say when and when he does this, I'll repeat it back to him correctly, as nine times out of 10, he'll have said it slightly wrong. Again, I'll overemphasize what I'm saying. And basically, I'm telling a story as I'm saying it with my facial expressions and my body language. This helps to keep him engaged. He typically repeats it back and I'll then tell him what it means and ask him to tell me what I've just told him so I know he's heard me and he's understood it. I try to keep it fairly simple, but here's a few examples of what he knows so far. Had your wished, Maloon, which means basically be quiet, my boy, or oh my head, which means oh my head, or gee your mother a bozy, but dinna gee laldi nu, kakani, which means just give, me, give your mum a cuddle or a hug, but not too rough, be gentle. That's just a few examples. Although Stuart needs a lot of support and guidance, he has an amazing capacity to learn. And he is such an incredible young man who is my inspiration to life. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Well, I think it's, it's great that you, you explained Stuart to us like you might explain the world to Stuart. Um, and it was, you know, and, and you did it as a story. And just that, but that, just the way you did it brought so much understanding to us. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you. I'm curious, Lisa. Um, I know Pauline, and she often mentions the word Doric, uh, and I'm really intrigued as to you know you hear Gaelic and things like that, and I'm interested in I'm interested in words and their origins. So I'm interested in where the or, what the origin of Doric actually is. Do I would have to pass. Yeah, yeah, you, you can do that, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Do Lisa speaks it, but she probably hasn't, like most of us, learned where it comes from. Um, Doric actually uh, referred to rustic language and would have included all peasant language way, way back, including um, parts of England as well. Um, but when Scots continued, um, they sort of branched off from English, if you like. Well, English branched off from Scots, actually. Um, Doric became associated with the North East in particular, um, and it has a particular dialect of the Scots language. So, yeah. I don't know if that answers your question, Shane. Yeah, pr pretty much, yeah. It's and we have Doric fr Frolics on Friday <laughs> with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Pauline Cordner. You know Pauline. Yes. And uh, we have shared many fields with Pauline. Yeah. And, uh, and she has Sheena Blackhouse, who's a, a singer, on with her. So Friday is definitely, Friday is definitely going to be Doric Frolics for children. Lisa, I was listening to you share your story of Stuart, and it dawned on me that in the World Storytelling Cafe, your story about Stuart also is a story about Stuart, who is a story unfolding. So please keep us in the loop. I think I speak for us all when I say we're interested in his next chapter. Asante <laughs> Sana, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I would agree with that, Baba. Lisa, that was really moving. I, I found it incredibly moving. And I, I, I've, m many years ago, I worked in, with similar children and, um, and, I, and I could relate to a lot of what you were saying, but it is just such a heartwarming story. And I, I'd, I'd like to be updated as well. Thank you. I can speak for days and weeks about Stuart, so <laughs> he's, 
Yeah, my and life. I could listen for days and weeks about stories about you and Stuart. <laughs> I've worked with a lot of children from different backgrounds and with a lot of challenges, but your story reminds me that when we put our minds to it and understand that it's not just about them understanding us, it's about us understanding them. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's, it's a great, I don't, now listen, I'm a, I'm a wordsmith and I'm having difficulty with words, but it's a, oh, it's a great feeling. It's a great, yeah, it's a great feeling, great emotion when we make those contacts and when we're able to allow them to share their stories with others. Can I just come in there? I, I, I had an experience, oh, maybe it was three years ago. I was asked to do, um, there was an event to raise some money for a young girl. Uh, and I was asked, it was music and stuff, mainly music actually. And I was asked if I would come along and tell some stories. And she, you know, she was in a chair, et cetera. And she, she, she had no, um, what I would describe to me anyway, for me is no recognizable language. You know, she certainly made some gestural noises. Um, but what I didn't notice until the end, until her mum pointed out, she had a little screen in front of her. And so, and she could, with her eyes, she could make particular icons come up. And, and her mother said to me, would you like to see my daughter Ruby's responses to your stories? And I said, oh, yes, please, you know, and I sat beside her and, and I went through the responses to the, and it was it 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 really opened my eyes, really. Um, you know, I, I try and if I tell to anybody, I try and be as myself, basically, whoever that person is, I try and be myself as much as possible. Um, and And what was good for me was just her responses were like any other child and why wouldn't they be of course you know but I think because of the language uh you know the difficulty that communication between us actually to sit with her afterwards and go over it was was just um just very, very I, I'm afraid to show my ignorance in a sense but I shouldn't be but it was it was just kind of very revealing to me and I, and I did something for a hospice about two years later, and there were several, you know, slightly older children in a similar situation. So I just, I was just fully me. <laughs> and, and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and I think that's just what I learned from that, is just be fully yourself when you tell a story, actually. Uh, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that, really. Yeah, yeah. I've got just a question. Just aside, real quick, just an aside. In the States, there is uh, technology being developed uh, it, it's in this beta uh, stage where you wear gloves and when you sign, it translates it into words that people can hear. Yes, I'm fascinated. I'm making up a story for that, but they sign with their, I don't sign, so I'm trying to be careful, but they sign with their hands and it translates through a speaker what's being said or an ear or an earbud. Isn't that great? Isn't that fantastic? Yeah, Lisa. Okay, John, I'm gonna use your line. I'm gonna shut up now. I'm sorry, Diana. You go. Doesn't matter. It was just I wanted to ask Lisa about any friends that she might have that were going through something similar with their children and how that supported her. Um, I've I've got many friends going through similar. Um, I started up a support group. Um, so I've got a lot of friends that go through similar. Um, so yeah, <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's been it, it's great. We go through a journey together. It's it's great having everybody that goes through and has similar experiences. Okay, thank you. I can, can I can I ask one question? Um, how much, how difficult is it to explain to teachers, or was it uh, difficult to explain to teachers? That that pre what the pre-verbal was still communication, and what looked like random hitting of the keyboard was not random at all, or the the tablet. I mean, it was not random at all. That had a pattern to it. Did you have difficulty explaining to to uh, to teachers that? Um, there's knowledgeable teachers, and there is teachers that you're still having that relationship with to pass on that knowledge. Um, I've been very lucky 
in the sense of where we are that we have we, we, we've got good relationships um the one yeah there is still there is still a, a lot of work to be done um there's not enough i would say training is what i would say there's not enough training for teachers um and it's i would it's not their fault um so there's a lack of awareness and a lack of understanding I know if Justine had been on the programme today because she has a five-year-old who's in that, probably the stage that Stuart was in at uh, five, around that, and it's been really difficult for her to find a school where they, where, that satisfied her as, um, uh, as a parent. Uh, and she's found, I think she's found fantastic teachers now, but I... I uh, I'm not sure. I think, but it's been a journey. <laughs> yeah, that it it is. It is a journey, um, and it's you know the the logo for our support group is a boat on a wave because you have you've got to take the rough with the smooth, and it is that's what it is like having autism and other conditions. It is like being on you know it's like being on the waves. Um, sometimes you are on a storm. Sometimes you're on the calm. Um, and when you're dealing with services, um, it's exhausting and it can be exhausting. Sometimes you have knowledgeable ones where they understand and you're not having to fight and explain things. And then sometimes you're having to fight and explain every single detail. Um, it just depends. But I, yeah, Jackie, I'm going to pass back to you now. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I just, I just know that Lisa is a great advocate and teacher, and I learned a great deal um, from Lisa, and was very privileged to do so. So, um, thank you very much for sharing that, Lisa. And yeah, that would be love. Well, I want to keep hearing about Stuart, obviously. <laughs> We're going to go to Cooley now and hear some poetry. Just have a slight change of tempo, Cooley. Thank you very much. I'm not very good at um, sign language. I don't get everywhere and nobody can understand me. <laughs> so I'm going to read some my my poetry book called A Wonder Woman. And I've got here A Wonder Woman. <laughs> So, here we go. This, this poem is called Wedding Day. It's got a couple of Indian words in it. Lenga is the dress I wear, and it's the, it's the beautiful dress that you wear for the, for the wedding. And Mendy is the henna on your hands. Okay. And Wedding day. The air carried a spicy chill on this auspicious autumn morning. I, the centre of attention, dressed in a saffron gold langa, in shades of liberty, new beginnings, like the mendy on my hands, on the on the day I thought would never come. In every colour of the rainbow, all guests arrived at the registrar office to witness our vows, like a poetry reading. I was bursting, trembling in happiness, petrified. Could I do this? Could I say it out loud? Was this, was I sure? This was the man match made in heaven, just for me, or just an escape. In a smiley day, haze, days, hazy thoughts ran wild, like clouds of cosmic energy. Could someone really accept me as a wife? 
may be as a sacrifice. I listened to the promise of a man who silently spoke through his eyes. I stood next to him, heartbeat like clockwork, opening a new chapter of life, of caring, sharing, of mutual respect. As the innocent stars shaped us together. After the vows had been spoken, I was handed his wedding ring. With a sudden spasm and a jerk, I dropped it. My heart stopped. The room echoed in delightful surprise and laughter as we watched the gold ring roll away like a penny, like a dream. Was this an omen or some kind of sign? Or was it a taste of what, what, what was coming, what to expect? Now, after a quarter of a century, he still chases, picks everything up I dropped, including me. I'm going to read the two, two short ones, two, no, two, two new short, short ones. I think I read this one before, but I'm going to read it again. Um, born drunk. As I walked down the street, old Asian women began to think. They stared at me head to feet. She's had too much to drink. Babbling nonsense. I wasn't torn. Yes, I said, God sent me tipsy, drunk. A party before I was born. Desperate for oxygen, but drank whiskey. Next, the last one is called Still, Still Smiling. I sacrificed my youth for true affection. A love that was never fair. I sacrificed years of finding a connection. A link that was never there. I sacrificed my health in pain, in suffering that was wasted. I sacrificed my wealth, no gain, the money I never tasted. I sacrificed my desire to learn, the knowledge I cannot recall. Lost my freedom to spend as I earn. No one heard my frantic call. One thing I did not give up. My glowing smile mercifully kept my boat going. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Cooley. I could listen to your poems all night long. <laughs> I, 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 I love your humor and the way you look at the world. It's <laughs> wonderful. Now, uh, we're going to go to Teresa in a moment, but first, I think Amin wanted to say something and I didn't. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, Kuli, your glowing smile, too good. It's beautiful. And I love that first one, your long skirt that is called Lehenga and the Mahandi. <laughs> That's yeah. Indian attire, which you are talking about. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah, and especially hats off to the teachers who all are training these kind of children. I, that's what I want to say, because I can understand one of my cousin, he has also the same problem and I we understand him because we have to get the expressions and the way they talk, we can understand what they are going to say. And sometimes, and teachers are the one, see sitting so many children aside and teacher understanding each and every mind for, uh, for each and every child, that's too difficult. And running, going through this profession is, I can't give the words, it's too good. And thank you so much, all the teachers. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh. And yes, I just want to say thanks to David also. He personally messaged me, please listen to my story because of that I'm here. I just want to listen his story. He's not there, but he would be listening after that. Thank you so much, David. Wow. <laughs> 
he will be thrilled that uh, that you came. So that's fantastic. Teresa, I think you're going to be up next. I'll hand over to you. Hi, everyone. Nice to be here again. And um, I hope David comes back because I'm really pleased that he's doing this again, because I think it's really valuable in all sorts of ways. And um, it's just so fascinating as well. There's so much to learn about people, isn't there? And um, I, I've been asked to, John sent me a message yesterday to talk about how mental health can affect one physically. So I can't really speak for uh, any other conditions except for my own. So that's the perspective that I will take. And um, I have what's called complex post-traumatic stress disorder uh, with a dissociative disorder. So basically, PTSD um, affects people that have been in a life and death situation usually, or they've witnessed somebody else being in a life or death situation. And complex PTSD is, um, is where there's a, either sort of a prolonged period of trauma or repeat, repetition or multiple um, uh, experiences of trauma sometimes from childhood so and what what basically it, it has happened it, it because it's a it's a disorder it, it, it there are natural ways that our bodies respond to to threat um, so you've all probably heard of the fight or flight dilemma uh, but there's also a freeze element that can go on where it's not safe to fight or flight so there are three aspects to our stress responses and somebody that has a post-traumatic stress disorder basically what has happened to them is that they've become their whole systems have become completely overwhelmed and the dissociation aspect is where the body uses its intelligence to kind of absent itself in order to survive. So these are survival mechanisms that are unprocessed. It's basically, it's overwhelm that someone's experienced that is unprocessed. So people think about mental health as about being emotional and uh, it's very far from that because it, you know, I, I uh, my own perspective has been for many years that, uh, about a whole body system is the whole person, you know, body, mind, spirit, that you can't separate them out. And that's certainly true of my condition. Um, and uh, I'm pretty sure that that's true of other conditions as well, but I haven't researched them as much as I have mine, obviously. So... So basically, uh, a stress response, um, if we're in a situation where we're in a fight-flight situation, so any normal stressor that we could, our body might perceive that as a, right, I'm going to go fight this or I'm going to, you know, run away from this. What happens is in our brain, the amygdala fires up and the body has this surge of adrenaline which i'm sure all of you can relate to and uh, it rushes um and it, it to in, it increases the heart rate and it pumps all the muscles up it it, uh, it also increases our respiration um in order to prepare us for action so it's either to run towards or to run away. And what happens when when we're in that, that our adrenaline's flying and we're in that stressed out state, and I'm not talking about, you know, the stress of the wrong pizza being de delivered, which some people call traumatic. <laughs> I'm talking about a life death threat. So what happens is in that situation, because of our survival 
uh, aspects, the frontal lobes of the brain shut down. So normal decision making in that, you know, you, you couldn't uh, order a pizza for instance in that situation because your brain wouldn't be able to find the phone find the number uh, wouldn't be able to decide that that's what needed to happen so I don't know why I've picked on pizzas but somebody, somebody eating pizza here so I'm picking up pizzas and um, so what happens is in that fight or flight response normal deci decision making isn't available it can affect speech it can affect all sorts of things so that's the sympathetic nervous system wow. so it affects that greatly and it affects also the parasympathetic nervous system so when it isn't safe to fight or flight or flee or or when the danger is passed other chemical responses take place and that that can reduce the heart rate very very low and um, and it can lead to sort of physical collapse exhaustion weakness um, it can affect our gastrointestinal systems um, and, and basically it it makes people in the free state um, they can submit they're not they're quite passive they're not able to challenge or in, in any form at all so it has a huge impact on our physical symptoms and, and people that have particularly i can only speak from my own experience again but with complex ptsd uh, i don't have memories i have re-experiences so if i'm talking to you about something that's happened in the past i get the same emotions the same smells the same visions and i see all of that in, in imagery and um and the same feelings in my body as if i if as if it was happening now uh. and that's because the frontal cortex has switched down and it doesn't have have that memory storage. It just has those feelings and experiences to, to recall. So when there's a trigger, those memory centers uh, shut down in the frontal uh, cortex and we get overwhelmed by feelings and impulses uh, to to be driven to action at to driven to action often. Uh, people with PTSD or complex PTSD can be very impulsive and it has a, a, a huge impact um, on daily living um, and there is strong evidence now there's a huge body of evidence that the you know prolonged stress can create cardiovascular issues musculoskeletal issues and and um, increasingly as the evidence grows it, it people do need to even the professional people need to uh, understand that this is a quite a complex thing that mental uh, I, I would love to see the name mental removed from these these descriptions of people because like Lisa, you know, even with people that one would expect to know about these things, they have very little understanding. And um, I experience a lot of uh, episodes with my heart. Um, I have atrial fibrillation, which my doctors attribute to this effect on the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. And um, I had some really wonderful news today that I, they've been, they're going to refer me to St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London to the, um, the, top, the top team in the country for atrial fibrillation because of my complex condition, which is, has been a long time coming. And so I'm very happy about that. So 
basically the survival response in us the system becomes can become chronically activated which is when you get these other complex conditions that go alongside and uh, I, like if I get uh, uh, triggered is a, is a common word used in trauma it basically means something happens that can trigger the brain to perceive it as a, a threat um, I, it, depending on the level of threat my body can be in an activated state as long as you know we, it can be like that for weeks and obviously that has a huge impact on one's physicality so um, I don't really know what else to say except that perhaps I could just tell you how I feel right now that might be informative so I had a, a major trigger on Friday and ended up in AF again and um, I was in my heart goes into atrial fibrillation is where it goes into a really extreme rhythm so it goes slow and it goes fast and it goes you know and it, it's quite dangerous so often I end up in the resuscitation unit in the A&E department and um, so I had another episode but I've been, I'm having them probably about every two to three weeks at the moment since about October and because my heart's not pumping properly it affects how my brain functions but also the CPTSD obviously affects brain function as well as I've explained so um, it can be like you know I, I find it quite difficult to concentrate um, you know if you see me up my shutting my eyes it's just because I can't take in all of the visuals anymore and um, uh, it can leave me sort of you know I could be mid-sentence and not know what the hell I'm gonna say next or what I was talking about a moment ago you know so it, it has a huge impact and uh, and just going back again to what Lisa was saying you know it, it's really surprised me um, how little even people even psychologists that are generalists you would expect them to know a lot more about these conditions than they do and and basically I made a decision a few years ago that I was going to educate people on behalf of everyone else that has got mental health issues in the world um, at, at every opportunity particularly those that I felt it was necessary and you know I have a lot of experience with paramedics and doctors and nurses and so I spend a lot of time telling them all about, you know, uh, because a lot of their colleagues, especially the paramedics, you know, I've met quite a few now that also have PTSD because they are their first responders. And, you know, one of the things that's coming out of this pandemic is is going to be a, a huge increase in first responders that are going to need mental health support. And so... I've spent the last four years uh, educating my very fantastic GP who's really willing and able but you know if anyone uh, knows anywhere that wants someone to talk about mental health and PTSD in particular please uh, it's my mission to educate the world on behalf of others because it's the mental health services in this country are actually really lacking uh, funding and expertise and uh, I'm very very fortunate that I have a really great GP and uh, and I'm I'm on the waiting list for treatment at the, the top London Hospital Maudsley Hospital with with a with a trauma expert but those the, the, that training needs to filter through um, because lots of people experience you know you could be in a car crash and there are there are you know those one-off incidents can have an impact on somebody for the rest of their lives if if and there are simple things simple treatments and therapies that can help with those things you know it's not like 
people think you can't recover from these things you can and that's what's very frustrating there are, and I, i'm on the waiting list for sensory motor therapy which sounds weird because it's talking therapies don't help with people that are, are recovering from trauma because they just re-experience what they've been through it doesn't enable them to process but there are other therapies that can help that and sensory motor therapy is all about embodiment and because basically the trauma is kind of trapped in your body and uh, so i'm waiting for for treatment in london for that i'm on the waiting list and once i have that 14 weeks of sensory motor therapy that's supposed to help one manage triggers and then we start the long process of integrating the experiences with a what's called lifespan integration therapy and uh you know i i do feel very like one of the lucky ones because these things it's been a huge battle to even get an assessment you know uh, it's been it's been an, a minefield and and all the way along the line i've just been really appreciative of how because i'm articulate and i have a, a strong education it feels really important to me that i use those things for others that don't have that because there are lots of people out there that are up against these horrendous political and funding issues and and you don't even know what's going on half the time while people are refusing you be, until you research it and develop and delve into it so it's been really really difficult and um i have a wonderful support and um you know it affects uh, lots of things i do i.e storytelling and i, I just to finish off i just want to say that the last time that david had this um discussion i wasn't going to say anything i just came to support david thank you david um but i i decided to speak at the end because i found listening to everyone else so valuable so i really want to thank you david again for inviting me to come back and talk today because um you know i am on this sort of education mission and and you know david if if you hadn't sort of organized with john and jackie these events i wouldn't be able to say any of what i've just said so thank you very much indeed and also to thank john and jackie and lisa for the support that they offered me after the last conversation i had in this forum where i was sort of asking for help i did tell my story uh, that I was trying to, uh, they gave me absolutely wonderful help in order to do that. So thank you as well. Dad, <laughs> Up to the mid the good door. Thank you. I think, go on, Jack. No, carry on, Teresa. <laughs> I, I was going to ask you, David, were you saying that to tell stories about mental health? Is that what you said? No. I'll. Uh, I'll do go mid and the uh, red button the weird or the lockdown. David, sorry, I, I think your connection is, because I'm not hearing it very clearly, I think the connection is okay. a bit dodgy. Can you write the question? I, I'm getting a little bit of it, but the connection's not very good. Okay. 
And while you're doing that, I'm just aware of the time. John, we'll need to finish soon, will we? But Diana's come along. Uh, no, well, that, that's okay. We, we you know, um, the, the, it, we, we've, we've got time and uh, Ali's, Ali's magic carpet hasn't run out of gas yet. Uh, so that, that's okay. David, um, were you saying, how does uh -huh. storytelling help your mental health during lockdown? Well, do uh, uh, or was I a million miles off the mark? Oh no, I was right. Yay! <laughs> so I, I actually go, find go, go. storytelling really stressful, um, which makes it difficult because then when my when my body releases adrenaline my brain thinks that I'm in a life death situation and can shut down the frontal cortex. And I'm like, Oh my God, what's happening now? <laughs> and I, and so I have to sort of search somewhere for what comes next. And so I find it quite, quite stressful. So, but John, John, I've just got to share your little tip that you gave me, which I loved was John was saying to me after we meet regularly because he's helping me edit my poetry. He said to me, you know, if you're telling a story and the young woman has got to pick up the little box off the bedside table for later on in the story and then she ends up in the forest face to face with the giant in front of her and realizes that she needs the box right then and she hasn't got it all she needs to do is go back and get it <laughs> and i was like yeah <laughs> teresa, i loved it teresa teresa and pardon me if i said it incorrectly i on the other hand find storytelling a great release um okay confession time I live with something called uh, nonspecific bipolar disorder. Go figure. Um, and the best treatment for me over the years, the decades, has been doing what I do. I tell stories. It's better than the medications that didn't work. Uh, it's better than keeping it inside. My, my biggest challenge is <clears throat> selectively, well, when I share with people that I have, that I'm bipolar, their responses are not very encouraging. They begin to handle me like I have gone insane. And anytime I have a complaint or disagreement, they want to blame it on me being bipolar. And, and sadly, that includes all but one member of my family. However, this platform, several other channels, and telling stories, period, teaching young ones and older people I find to be the best therapy and allows me to release and maintain some equal level of uh, sensibility. I tell people I may be crazy, but I'm not insane. <laughs> and I'll, I'll wrap it up by saying this, telling stories, I, I tell people that, I tell my GP and my specialist for other things, because I have uh, our uh, a, a fib flutter, which is not quite the same thing, but you know, I tell folks, the day I lose my humor, the day I stop making jokes, we have a problem. We meaning me. So I, I appreciate you sharing your story. And this is the first time I've shared on a platform, let alone an international platform, that I live with bipolar, nonspecific bipolar disorder. And if any of you start treating me differently, I'll have John come after you. But anyhow... <laughs> Thank you very, very much, uh, you and Jackie and Lisa and David, who I think is a giant among giants, and um, um, the mother of jazz, <laughs> Name. I see why your daughter is so talented and giving. She has a mother who is so talented and giving. Uh, let me, uh, I, 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 I see the floor. I'm getting emotional. Thank you, Baba. Thank you so I, I normally um, wanted to say something, I think, but before yes. we go on, um, I want to uh, share that uh, Teresa is a fantastic poet, and but and I think one, but and I, but there's a reason I'm saying that that she's producing a book at the moment, 
and I think it's really relevant, and Cooley will appreciate this as well. As well, when you're sh- when you're producing a book, you are in control, and so you can you can you can decide what to put in and what to, and you can do it at your own time, and it's not like being put on the spot. So, um, and uh, and it's going to be an amazing collection. I'm I'm. Um, I'm I'm going through it with Teresa, and it's uh, and I you know it's a real honour. Um, so thank you, Teresa, for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Norman had something. Sorry, yeah. uh, Teresa. I, yeah, thank you. Um, I wanted to say well two things uh, to you, Teresa. Uh, one was for for Cooley earlier, but they both of them apply. When I worked at a place called the Sproul Garden, which was an outdoor arts program, where children of all kinds under the trees too long to describe but we had the first thing i wanted to mention we had an uh, an activity we're all in a circle we all pass a stone and we clap pass clap pass. gets more complicated but that's essentially it and somebody once asked and we there's people in wheelchairs there's uh, people in on crutches there are people who just have trouble they're sitting on the ground they said, well, what happens if we drop the stone? You pick it up again. And that's the, the, the only thing is you pick it up again. There's nothing to it. Um, and it may take you a while, but you do. The other thing is what I call the hidden listener and the challenge for somebody who is telling the story of their trauma is that when we're telling stories, when I tell a story, anybody who tells a story, but there's somebody who's called, I call the hidden listener, and that's the person telling the story. When we, and when a story is being told and heard, it is being recreated, co-created, relived. And so there's a challenge. How do you go into the explanation of what caused the trauma without revisiting and being the trauma all over again. And I, I'm not saying I have an answer, but I can, that is my response to why telling the story can be such a challenge because we are also yeah. listening to it and living it. Yeah, that's it, my little bit. Thank you, Norman. Yeah, can I just, uh, I, I can uh, um, sort of re- uh, respond to that because um one of the therapies that is available now for people for sort of single episode traumas is called EMDR, which is eye movement desensitization response. Yeah, I heard that. And basically what how it works is you don't have to talk about the trauma, but you can just focus on like a snapshot of it. So take a you know, a, a photographic image of one moment in that trauma and focus on that. And whilst your eyes are following a light bar. So, and what it, what the theory is, it was developed by a man called Shapiro in the 1980s, is it puts your brain into a rapid eye movement like REM sleep. And, and the theory being that the REM part of our sleep is us processing what's occurred during the day. So, and, and then it moves unprocessed, aspects into a processed part of the brain so it kind of refile puts it in the right file if you like and uh, I had some experience of EMDR and uh, for sin- for single event trauma it's highly effective and um, so and the sensory motor therapy that I'm waiting for again it, it, it deals with the trauma so for instance I have a a stoop which is kind of like a, a closing in it, it, it enables one to look at posture and how to become upright what makes you feel safe in that you know because you obviously don't feel safe like that you you find way so it, it it's a different kind of approach completely um and we, which is what these wonderful new therapies are are uh, enabling people to recover Real quick, there's an old saying that says when a door closes, a window opens. But I say when a door closes, open that sucker back up. That's what doors do. And the other thing is, is that in America, you may have been hearing about the horrible, repetitious thing we're going through with massive gun shootings. 
And our non-functional Congress keeps talking about mental health issues, but they don't fund mental health issues. Um, so I find this to be a very effective alternative as I'm sure our audience does, whether they're conscious of it or not, of uh, addressing uh, mental and emotional challenges and resolutions. And in listening to you, I just realized I've had f at least four near death experiences in my life, most of them before I hit the age of 30 and half of those before I hit the age of 17. Now, having recognized that, it allows me to release that energy because I'm here. <laughs> So, you know, there's no Sankofa, doubt about that. You are definitely you. here. <laughs> Sankofa is looking back to move forward. And you can look and relive issues of the past. Just don't get stuck there. Take that information and move forward. Um, I cede the floor. A minute ago. I want to note that for a minute, a minute, note a minute, but okay, the ne. The a little bit that the character is by how to get it for a little bit of no it Cool. So, Diana, it's you, and you're going to tell us about it. Yeah. About what you right, did. it's been fascinating. Right, it's been fascinating being here tonight. Unfortunately, I couldn't manage the last one, but thank you, David, for inviting me. And I know that Jackie's told you a lot about, and I've said already a little bit about what I do, because there's so many different ways to tell stories. And really, how I got involved was um, through doing fun things with music and rhythm and interaction. And all of this was very stimulating for different audiences of different ages and abilities. And it led me into the storytelling. Um, and I started off with preschoolers and I really enjoyed that because you know they're very honest and if they like something, they'll be glued to what you're saying or if they don't like it, they'll just look away. But what it taught me at an early stage was you know, about catching people's attention. And that's what fascinated me about tonight, about what David said and what Lisa and Teresa are saying. There are so many different ways to capture people's attention. And what I've done in the past is I've had a lot of props. So maybe you have a hat or um, and every time you're that character, you put that hat on. Or maybe you have a frog guido because you're telling a story about a frog that um, turned into a handsome prince. So you've got the sound, or you might have touch like the Midas touch. And there's so many things you could touch. You could tell that whole story about King Midas with just touching things. And, you know, you could link it with words, but why not link it with sign language or link it with, um, you know, something else, musical sound in the background or whatever. And I've done loads of wonderful things. And one of the best things I ever did was... Um, go up to a place called Peterhead, where all these people with different um, backgrounds and that came and different abilities. And they helped me to tell the story. And a lot of the people didn't have speech, but it was a wonderful time. It was celebrate Ravi Burns, um, Scottish poet. So we had the story of Tam Shanter. And to begin with, I'd played the music, Scottish music, and everybody was dancing. And there in the pub was Suter Johnny and Tam himself. And you know, you gave somebody a hat and they were convinced they were Tam then. And then you moved on to the next part and um, you know, going down by the graveyard or you might've even had Tam's wife walking up and down because she's so annoyed, she's pacing the room because her husband's not home and there's no phones in those days and what is she going to do? So, and somebody was more than happy to act that out. 
And then we had the bit with the churchyard and the, the, the warlocks and the witches and coming after and the music that they were making and the songs. And then the chase, the chase was on after Meg the horse that Tom was on. And they were going so fast, David, they really were. And we had the William Tell over to her playing and it was designed in the new years. And we got there, we just got to the running water in time. Because if you get to the running water in time, then you're safe, you're away. But oh dear, poor Meg got her tail taken off. So, but then Tam got home. Now you might think Tam been saved, but Tam had still to face his wife. He had still to face his wife, face his wife, Jean, and that was nothing to be taken too lightly at all. But there's been lots of different ones, and it's been amazing how people are responsive to different ways of storytelling, like I say, touch or smells. I've heard quite a lot of um, stories about smells, and you could just tell the story with introducing different smells and maybe even giving your audience a chance for them to contribute to the story, and then you could write it down and do it again. But that's what I find fascinating about story. There's so many ways of exploring. There's so many ways of finding out more, and that's why things like this are wonderful. But thank you, David. I very much enjoyed all your passion and your commitment and your story. And thank you very much for inviting me along tonight. Diana, you must come to our worldwide story round and <clears throat> tell stories. Maybe do a children's, a Friday night for children, because you had us uh -huh. with, that, yeah. with just that snippet of a story. We're all there. So, uh, so John, John I've, I've, I've heard Diana a couple of three times before, at least haven't I, Diana, another story yeah. club. And I just love the way you tell, because it's it's you're not singing the song, but it's so musical the way you deliver. Oh, it's, yeah. I just love it, and I knew you'd go down so well here. It's just a, such a great delivery. Yeah, and how come I haven't bumped into you in the last year and a half of doing this? I'm, I'm remiss. I my light under a bushel, but I'll come out. <laughs> I I've heard you tell before as well, Diana. Was that at Maria's? Um... Yeah, what well, that's yeah. where I've heard Jean as well. So I love. Once upon a Wednesday, because I really feel that that gave you the opportunity to to be a lot more um, communicative, telling stories at a time when it was difficult. But there's so many different people, and um, I, I do love the Once Upon a Wednesday and the Barn as well. So, but no, it's been great. Okay, well, I the body rock. A uh, Bible or auto into the PPP called the world to a the the bonnet is a mother to be a bed. The cat is a medical or a law. Okay. What other medical is a Okay. Absolutely, David. So everybody, please, please, please keep coming to the World Storytelling Cafe. And if you've enjoyed tonight, please put something in the heart and all the money that goes in the heart will go towards the wonderful storytelling festival in Marrakesh in February next year. And Marrakesh is in Morocco in Africa, in case you didn't know. Is that covered it, David? I think uh, actually I'm yeah. going to have I'm going to have a wee word now and just say, David, thank you so much. You have brought us together for another wonderful event, and claps to you, young man. And I will uh, echo I will I will echo what Jackie said. If I can just get in the pre what what's coming up, 
David, and then I'll give you the last. Okay. For a change, I'll give you the last word. Um, so the uh, <clears throat> we got on the uh, we got tomorrow night at five o'clock or uh, five o'clock uh, is our wonderful young international tellers. And we have children from all over the world coming and telling stories. Uh, in fact, Jasnami has taken over her mum's uh, her mum's internet because it's uh, it's the daughter's names up there rather than the rather than mum's name. <laughs> and, uh, so that's Amon. That's not Jasnami. Jasnami is the star. Um, so we have uh, with children from Gaza and all over uh, Gaza, India, um, Italy. Um, that's Tuesday night and every Tuesday night. So if you know any young storytellers that are 18 and under, just bring them along. They, they're welcome to come and tell tales. Uh, Friday, there's uh, Friday, there's me telling stories for children. I'm sorry about that, but that's, you know, I have to. I have to do what I do occasionally rather than just compare it. And um, then uh, Sunday is, I mentioned it earlier, we got Doric Frolix from uh, from Christine Cordner and uh, Sheena Blackhouse. Um, so uh, that that's brilliant. And then uh, I don't know what's happening next Monday, but that's quite enough to keep in your heads. Um, just keep looking at our um, schedule. David, uh, well, uh, one more round of applause for David Thompson putting a fantastic night together. Thank you, David. And David, a last word from you. Well, or, or no, before you do the last word, there's always, I'm always cutting you in to you. Thank you, Ali, for driving the magic carpet. Over to you, David. <laughs> wow. Uh, oh, everybody, no, I don't want to do a little bit of a little bit of a little Go get a bit daddy out of me. Do me daddy. Do me daddy. I was, I, was, I was going to let you have the last word, David. Okay, so um, really disability and storytelling. I think you put them together, David, like a glove, a hand in a glove. And I think that's the message of tonight, that we need to have more disability in storytelling and more storytelling in disability. And thank you, David. Well, we are all going to share that message with the world. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, David. Okay. I don't know anybody did it better. Go a bottle of the story of mom. Yep. Go the story of little. And they will all, everybody is welcome here, David. I think that is, uh, you know, and we have to thank John for making this such a welcoming place and enabling everybody to come and share their stories. Now I think we need to let him go and have his tea, don't you? He's not allowed to eat, he's got to no. just tell stories. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the American is having coffee. Oh, <laughs> I've got to oh. pop. I've got to pop down the shop and buy something. <laughs> I've got to get there before they close. <laughs> Good night for fish and chips, John. <laughs> That's not a bad idea, actually. Yeah, it's really uh, fun, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Monday night. The chip, chippies are closed on Monday, aren't they? Oh. Uh, <laughs> Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night everybody. I'm going to close you all time. down. Bye. 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 David, of course, has got another word to say. Bye. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, I'm really, really busy this week, David. I'll email you and organise something, OK? OK. That would be nice. Bye okay. just now. Bye. I'm closing mm -hmm. down. Get out the door, mm -hmm. everybody. Out, out. <laughs> <laughs>